Our next speaker is Jessa. What does this picture of a tricked out truck have to teach us about the future of libraries? My name is Jessa Lingle. I work as a researcher at Microsoft Research in Cambridge, Massachusetts. But before that, I was a librarian. To be a librarian in the 21st century in the United States is to invite a lot of skepticism. So people are constantly asking you things like, well, who needs librarians when we have Google? Or who needs libraries when you have ebooks? It's disheartening if you're a person who loves and believes in libraries as social institutions to confront so frequently this idea that, much like this picture of an abandoned school library in Russia, libraries are in a state of decay. And that's because they're fundamentally incapable of keeping up with rapid technological change. I want to tell a different story about the future of the library. It's a story about libraries being a vital resource of communication, uh, a vital resource for their communities in terms of technology and communication. It's a story I've heard from activists who see libraries as this fundamental part of their strategies for community outreach. And this is a story that I heard in Haiti. Yes, the Republic of Haiti. It's a country of about 10 million people, 600 miles south and east of the United States. It's this really beautiful country with a fiercely proud history of resistance and independence. It's also a country of extreme poverty. It's the poorest in the Western Hemisphere. Many of Haiti's political and economic problems long predate the earthquake that happened four years ago this month. But I want to tell you about one of the development initiatives that came out of the earthquake. Um, and it's been really successful, which is exciting in its own right, but it also has these exciting implications both for libraries in terms of their future and also community development initiatives more generally. I should state at the outset that unlike all the amazing women um, we've heard from already, this is not a project that I conceptualized and got off the ground. I went to Haiti as a social science researcher. I was doing some weeks of initial field work on mobile technology. But usually when you hear the phrase mobile technology, you think of you know, cell phones and tablets. I was interested in bookmobiles. So bookmobiles is literally mobile technology. <laughs> and <laughs> I want to share some of the things that I learned about mobile technology in Haiti um, as a way of getting us thinking about what makes community development projects work and also about my personal passion, which is libraries in their communities. This is a tap-tap, which is a distinctly Haitian form of public transportation. So if you want to make a tap-tap, you take a pickup truck, you put an extra tall covering on top of it, you maybe put some benches along the inside, and then you drive up and down Haiti's very busy roads, and you fit as many passengers as you can. If you're a librarian and you want to take library resources to remote parts of the country, you do the same thing, but instead of people, you put as many books and laptops as you can fit and afford, and that's how you convert a tap tap into a biblio tap tap. So two years ago, Librarians Without Borders um, came to Haiti and they partnered with three local library institutions, and each of those library institutions has a biblio tap tap. Each tap tap can hold about 1,000 books. Um, they operate five days a week, and together they serve around 8,000 people in a month. They offer book lending. Also, they provide technological resources, literacy programs, reading activities. Um, they, some of the tap tap librarians I met told me that when the tap taps come to a village or a town, it's not unusual for people to spend the entire day with them. We're talking like eight hours, just exactly like this. So why is it that tap taps work? Well, one reason is that rather than coming to Haiti with their own ideas of what a bookmobile should be, Librarians Without Borders, which is actually a French organization, they came and they partnered with three local Haitian library organizations, uh, Focal, uh, La Direccion Nacional du Livre, and National Library of Haiti. So rather um, than sort of taking over themselves, Librarians Without Borders provides the funding and they provide some of the training, but the day-to-day -day operations are left to these individual local institutions. So instead of inventing infrastructure, BiblioTapTaps grew out of existing organizations and existing library knowledge. Another reason that TapTaps work 
has to do with Haiti's local, local infrastructure, its physical infrastructure. So in the wake of the 2010 earthquake, a bunch of library organizations really wanted to go to displaced person camps and bring bookmobiles. But the bookmobiles they had in mind are the kind that you would see in the United States, which are usually these school bus or motorhome type vehicles. In the best of times, those could only navigate a fraction of Haiti's roads. <laughs> Haiti's roads. Tap taps, by contrast, navigate Haitian roads all the time, and they're this deeply familiar sight all throughout the country. So rather than being a hulking symbol of foreign ineptitude, biblio tap taps represent local practices and local infrastructures. The principles at work in ta Biblio Tap Tap's success can be applied to other activist projects. And in fact, they take us all the way back to mid-century library theory. So this is old man Jesse Shira. He was a very influential librarian in the United States. And he had this belief that libraries were social institutions that should reflect and practice the ethics and norms of their surroundings. He believed in particular that librarians needed training and communication, both to communicate with their patrons and also to communicate patron values to a wider community. The problem is that too often, this doctrine has been taken to mean what books are on the shelves. So a library is true to its community if it communicates that community's values in terms of the books and media and the stacks. There's a much broader way to interpret Jesse Shearer's ideas. My favorite US example of seeing this work was the People's Library at Occupy Wall Street. So before Zuccotti Park was raided, um, I was both a visitor and a volunteer at the People's Library. Now I'm like paranoid that the slides behind me aren't right, but this is right. Um, so I learned a lot at the People's Library. And I was constantly inspired by how the library responded to and reflected the protests, needs, and ethics, and politics. So for example, sure, it was reflected in the books that were on the shelves, but really in the bins, but it was also the collection development policy as a whole. I mean, the entire library was comprised of donated books. And it was in the lending policy, which was basically indefinite. Anyone could come and take a book for as long as they wanted, unless you were the NYPD. <laughs> Um, it was also staffed entirely by volunteers, and it was open whenever the protest was open. So sometimes that meant that the library consisted of librarians with books on their bikes or in shopping carts or in their tote bags. What I learned from the People's Library is that if libraries want to be activist social institutions, they need to view local infrastructure not as these obstacles to overcome and not as limitations, but as an opportunity to demonstrate a nuanced understanding of local practices and knowledge. Visions of the future of the library often look like this. Minimalist, highly structured. They're always devoid of paper. I'm not sure this is a vision we should embrace, especially not if we care about activist politics. This is a future that has a lot of assumptions about technology that I challenge. It has the idea that technology is better when it makes things cleaner and simpler. It says that technology is supposed to like come along and clean up human messiness. This is a first world fantasy of what technology is supposed to do, and it doesn't make sense in a lot of the world. Rather than envisioning the future like this, I think we should envision the future of the library as an organization that responds to local needs, provides local services, and to do that, you're gonna need to be really accepting of multiple kinds of technology, some of which might not always be that advanced. So imagine a library headquarters that's in a shipping container, if that's what you happen to have on hand. And maybe the resources that you have aren't even in a language that you speak, it's in a language that your patrons speak. And maybe there are technologies that are advanced, like laptops and tablets, but maybe there's also technologies that aren't so advanced, like air conditioning units and ceiling fans, if that's like what your librarians need to do their jobs. So when I think of all these things together, I realize that we don't need the future of the library to look like this if we really want it to be an activist institution, when it already looks like this. Thank you.